um, for just before we start. How many of you are using Elasticsearch today? Good. Um, this is not an intro level talk, all right? This is kind of a talk where I'm expecting the crowd to actually know about Elasticsearch, what it does, what it doesn't do. Um, so if we're expecting anything else, uh, you're free to live um, to s more inter interesting talks. Um, and I will uh, just, I, I will push some of the content that I planned originally to talk a bit about a current situation that's going on and uh, with Elasticsearch security. Um, so just expect that as well. And I'll, uh, I'll explain in a bit. Um, so my name is Itamar. Um, I've been doing Elasticsearch, search engines, this kind of stuff for quite a few years now. I'm an Elasticsearch consulting partner. Um, I'm operating through a brand called Big Data Boutique. We're doing all of sorts of things in the cloud using big data uh, as well as uh, Elasticsearch installations worldwide, including training. I'm a Microsoft MVP and a contributor to both uh, Lucene, Lucene.net, and, and Elasticsearch. Um, and our agenda today, again, not an intro talk, um, and I'm going quite fast now because I just I have more content to add because of the current situation that's going on, uh, meaning Elasticsearch clusters uh, being uh, hacked for ransom worldwide. Um, so I'll talk about this for a few minutes and show you uh, what needs to be done in order to protect that. Um, I think it's, it's actually even more important than giving you uh, some hat tips on how to use Elasticsearch in general. Um, we all, we'll talk a bit about designing a cluster and your document structure, um, just giving you some pointers to what things you can do better, or just based on my experience, things that maybe you're not aware of and are worth considering. Uh, we'll talk, based on that, we'll talk more about queries and some, some things that could happen in the analysis chain that you are using, whether you're aware of that or not, and I'll show you some stuff that could be happening in your cluster and may be worth your attention. We'll also talk about index mappings, some tricks, some do's and don'ts over there. Um, we'll talk about cluster management, how to manage a cluster, um, or to be more exact, some tips about managing your cluster, how it should look like, things you should be doing and shouldn't be doing, and we'll, I'll try to actually get to talk a bit also about data ingestion, how to correctly ingest lots of data into your Elasticsearch production clusters. So that's our agenda. Um, I wasn't planning on talking about that, but about a week ago, um, clusters, Elasticsearch clusters all over the world have been starting to, uh, to be hacked. Their data was being, starting to be deleted, and some message that looks like something like that um, was being posted into the clusters. B basically, if you had the clusters uh, of cluster with lots of data, you suddenly found that your cluster is entirely empty and found this ransom message on your clusters, asking you to pay for, to get your data back. Uh, anyone here has seen that before in the internet? Yeah, except from Niall, who actually tipped me on that. <laughs> All right, so be aware that this is currently happening. Um, this is like about, to, it started about a week ago, and clusters all over the world are, uh, we are talking about like 5,000 clusters right now, right? So about 5,000 clusters worldwide are, we know that have been hacked. Um, we know of some clusters that are not yet uh, been hacked or, but are still open to the web and could be hacked. So um, just if you have Elasticsearch clusters, just go back to your um, co company and make sure that your uh, clusters are secure. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to show you some stuff, some do's and don'ts um, about that. Um, just going back to the previous screen, notice the URL. So if you're using Elasticsearch, you know that Elasticsearch is accessible via the HTTP REST API over port 9200. And as you, as you can see, this is like, this is real. This is a couple of days ago. Um, as you can see, it's some public IP address accessible from my home, from my home network um, on port 9200. And warning is basically an index name uh, with that uh, node or that message. So that cluster was exposed to the web, and that what allowed the, the attacker to actually take the data, delete it, and then asking for ransom. So how do you protect your cluster? Um, basically, um, that's lots of pointers. I'll go through them a bit quickly, so we have time for the other content. I'll explain, and I'll be happily 
uh, stay after the talk or during the conference. If you have further questions, just come and ask me. I'll be happy to answer. Protecting your data is, is important. So in order to not fall for those ransom attacks, the first thing you should do is protect your uh, cluster from the public IP. Don't expose it on any public network. Now, that sounds obvious. Sometimes people don't do that. Elasticsearch 5 is a bit better at actually doing that by default, just letting you know when things are not configured correctly. And most of the clusters that we see that are exposed are bef uh, on versions before version 5. OK, so uh, 2 point something and even 1 point something, people are st still using that. And those are a bit uh, easier to get wrong. And that's where things start happening. So whatever you do, don't expose your uh, cluster on the public IP. The way you do that, you just go to the Elasticsearch YAML file and tell Elasticsearch what address to bind to, DNS or IP. Just make sure it's a private IP and not a public IP. So whatever your cluster is, the, whatever way your cluster is configured to, don't bind to a publicly accessible DNS or IP. That's like the first thing you should do. Uh, the configuration is called network.host in that, uh, just for you, so, so you have it. Um, that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do, you make sure, because now you close down uh, public access to your Elasticsearch clusters, you may have some client applications talking directly to Elasticsearch. That's a t totally an anti-pattern, but some people do that. And that's OK. I'm not judging. But now that you've closed down your public access to your cluster, you will need to somehow um, you know, make, allow some access. So you'll basically create a software facade through your application. You will filter or you'll proxy those requests through your code. I recommend not using the Elasticsearch DSL directly from your application. Um, to the Elasticsearch cluster, even though it, even if it goes through, through some sort of facade, just create your own API uh, against your web API and just translate that into the Elasticsearch queries. But again, the most important part is not to communicate directly with Elasticsearch and to filter those requests. And so, for example, not allow writes, only allow reads, and, uh, or, and filter the reads as well. Um, that's very important. Um, Next one, disable HTTP uh, access from nodes that don't really need it. So I'll, I'll talk about cluster topology later on the talk, but we have uh, master nodes, data nodes, client nodes. Only the client nodes really need uh, HTTP access. Master nodes definitely don't need HTTP enabled on that, on them. Data nodes on some installations, you will have HTTP enabled on some you don't. Again, find out where you can turn off the HTTP uh, access and turn it off. Um, and, and again, even if you can use ports that are not the default ports, that alone will make the uh, attacks less, uh, less common. Obscur security by obscurity is always a good thing. Um, sometimes you will have public nodes, pub uh, Elasticsearch nodes publicly available. A um, good example, a good use case, uh, use case example is uh, Kibana or COPF or all of those utilities that you use to monitor and query your Elasticsearch cluster. Basically, um, tools that are already available for you and ju you're just using, secure them as well. All right, so basically, I would recommend only exposing them uh, from a private IP and then connecting to some sort of a VPN and accessing that only through that VPN. Most VPNs today have two-factor authentication, stuff like that. So it's very it's highly protected, and that's the way to do it. But sometimes setting that, that up is a bit hard to do. And on, for those cases, it's OK to expose those endpoints to the public network, to the internet, basically. Again, binding to a public IP, but do put some sort of authentication layer around that. So I have a blog post uh, detailing all of that if you want more details. Um, and in that blog post, I have a link to a, a sample NGINX configuration that does all of that. It just adds some authentication layer on top of Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Kopf. Um, you can go ahead and look how it looks like. That's very easy to set up, and it's really, really important to do. Um, for those of you who are running Elasticsearch before version 5, especially versions 1.0, 1. something, um, you are very susceptible for uh, 
um, attacks using scripts, malicious scripts. So Elasticsearch until version five had Groovy as the default uh, scripting language before version 2.0. It had different uh, scripting languages. One of them was Groovy as well in some versions. And those dynamic scripting languages are not sandboxed. So an attacker could potentially inject a malicious script that should be used for querying, but it will, it will be used to some, somehow gain access to the machine itself. So disable dynamic scripting if you're before version five. Version five already took care of that for you. Um, the default scripting language is, is, uh, is safe to use. So again, wasn't planning on actually giving that intro, but it's super important. Just remember that and go check your clusters and feel free to reach out if you need any, any further advice. So that's about that. We have 50 minutes left uh, to talk about the actual content and forgive me if I skim through some of it. So let's start with the, a design. How to design your cluster, how to design your search uh, and your uh, um, cluster logging analysis. So we see two main patterns using Elasticsearch. The first one is what I call the monolith index. You have your data store somewhere and you replicate that data to Elasticsearch and use Elasticsearch as some sort of, uh, of a search facade and a way to basically dig through that data. Um, usually the recommendation is not to use Elasticsearch as a single source of truth. We'll talk about that in, in a bit. Um, but that index is, is the monolith index. It's where all your data is and that data is being continuously updated. The documents will be updated and you can't really um, you know, shard it into different uh, manageable entities. Um, it's being used a lot for, uh, for search, a text search, geospatial search, those kind of things, even e-image search. Um, record linkage, I have many text documents. I want to, to find uh, similar documents, um, anomaly detection, stuff like that. So that's one usage pattern. The second usage, usage, usage pattern uh, we see quite a lot and that's about 80, 90% of Elasticsearch users use Elasticsearch for that, is for centralized logging, right? So I have data that is time series data and I'm putting it into Elasticsearch continuously. In most use cases, uh, when people are using Elasticsearch for logs, about 95% of usages, um, that data will not, will not ever change. It's just logs, things that happened. So events, think about logs in your system, centralized logging. Think about IoT, so lots of sensors sending lots of data and that data doesn't change. It's only a thing that happened in the past. Um, a lot of times you'll see usages of Elasticsearch in that respect uh, with audit logging and stuff like that. So because that data doesn't change, you can safely just put that data in an in index and let's say call that index uh, using, the name, using the name of the date that is currently representing all the events in that index. And then when tomorrow comes, you just lock that index and move to indexing to a new index. So we call that pattern rolling indexes and time series data, um, time-based events. And again, about 80, 90% of Elasticsearch users use Elasticsearch for those use cases. Um, using the rolling indexes pattern, use, starting with Elasticsearch 5, um, gets a lot of attention and gets a lot of additional features. Um, and I'll cover some of them now. Um, but those two patterns are the thing to consider when you're approaching Elasticsearch. What is my usage pattern? And once you realize this, whether it's the monolith or is it a rolling indexes pattern, you can start approaching uh, Elasticsearch and try to understand what feature set you can use. So if you're having a monolith, if you're having just one index that gets data from your data store and just uh, uh, being updated over time, and uh, you search on that and facet and do aggregations, etc. Um, then the most important thing I can tell you is that you should treat it as a volatile index. Don't ever trust that index is there, and just make sure that you have the, a way to just recreate it from scratch using your data. What I'm basically saying: don't treat Elasticsearch as a single source of truth. That, that is going to give you lots of power. For example, um, like we'll discuss in a bit, um, you're going to learn a lot of stuff about the way your mapping works, the way you should create your, in, your documents based on your data, 
assuming your data is in SQL Server or an, S an SQL database, um, sometimes you'll have different design decisions around the structure of the documents you're going to index into Elasticsearch, and that's going to change over time as you learn about the usage patterns of your users. That's why once your index is you treat it as a, volatile, some, as a volatile index, so you can just delete it and create it from scratch, obviously there's, there's ways to do that without downtime, then you get a lot of power in, uh, on moving forward and improving on the experience. So that's my first advice to you. Um, the second reason I, why I'm saying that is because Elasticsearch themselves are not recommending Elasticsearch to be used as a single source of truth. I mean, they have a document, an official document, it's called the Elasticsearch Resiliency Document. Feel free to, to search for it. You'll see that they're still handling a lot of, of corrup data corruption issues and, and network uh, issues, stuff like that. This is in a much better situation than it has been uh, like you know, three years ago. Things have improved drastically, but still, the official recommendation is not to use Elasticsearch as a single source of truth. Um, another thing that you should note, uh, mainly um, for the places where either indexing takes a lot of time or uh, you're afraid of being ransomed, or um, just in places where, for example, in logs, in the rolling indexes pattern, uh, you have your data only in Elasticsearch, and that actually happens, and it's okay. Um, you should be using the backup and restore APIs. Now, backup and restore, or mainly backup, the backup operation in Elasticsearch is very, very cheap. So what you should be doing is just uh, executing a backup every five, 10 minutes, and it's perfectly okay, because all that's being happened is just files are being copied to the repository where your index is being backup. So it's perfectly okay, and that's something you should, you should and you can consider. There is also the ability to, uh, to re-index very efficiently with Elasticsearch, and that allows you to take data from one, one index and re-index that into another index using different mappings. Um, Elasticsearch has a re-index API built in. Elasticsearch 5 also supports re-indexing from different clusters, so it gives you uh, lots of power on that respect. Other than that, Elasticsearch 5 also adds some more APIs. I'll just mention them and move forward, but the Shrink API, for example, allows you to support large-scale indexing. It allows you to scale out your cluster to many, many shards, and then reshard it, basically, to a smaller number of shards um, to enable for faster and more efficient reads, and also uh, optimize the disk space and compression. It's a new feature in 5, and it allows to uh, very strong digestion cap capabilities in Elasticsearch. Also, the rollover API allows you to do a um, better rollover in the rolling indexes pattern. So you can now um, make sure that your indexes maintain a certain size in terms of, of documents in the index and their age. And this is how for, you can optimize on queries and, uh, and in, uh, index sizes uh, on disk. Um, let's talk a, a bit about document-oriented design. That's a very important topic in, in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a document store. It allows you to work against documents. It is not SQL, and it does not have uh, the concept of relations. Or I'm lying to you a bit. It does have something, and that's what I'm going to show you. But you shouldn't be relying on that, and that's my main point here. So let's take... Let's take a look at, a, at something that you probably have seen one way or another. I have a, an e-commerce store, and that e-commerce website has categories and it has products. Obviously, with Elasticsearch, it's represented as uh, documents. And so I have, in this case, one document that is a category and then two documents that are products. Now, those documents are related to one another in, in, in the following way. A product can be within a category, and then um, the, each category has a required member level. That's something that I put on a category level, and then I'm expecting my users that's being logged in to only see products under a category they're allowed to see. Right? So I have some sort of a relation between products and categories. That relation is for doing some stuff, um, but as you can see, the documents are completely separate from one another. 
if I wanted to query on to just show documents, product documents, that relate to a category in a certain way, for example, using that required member level token, I would have some issues doing that because those documents are completely unrelated. Elasticsearch allows, gives me some tools to handle that, and that's just, I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg going into a full-fledged uh, design discussion here. Uh, is completely out of scope. I just want to give you a taste of how it would look like. So the naive approach would be to put the products in the categories, in the category document. All right, so now I have all the products and the required member level, the token, is accessible from the same document. What is the problem with this approach? So I have one big document. Say I have one categ a category with thousands of products. That document is going to be way too big. And every update to every product is going to uh, trigger an update to the entire document of the category, which is a completely different concern. Also note, um, this re requires each product to have only one category. Unless, of course, I'm okay with uh, just uh, duplicating products in other category documents. So things are not that pretty. As it turns out, last, there is another concern here, which is a bit less intuitive. The, the fact is that this design with, is, is actually uh, entirely um, similar to this design. In Elasticsearch, hierarchy is being uh, flattened out into just field names with all the possible values. So products.name, I have two instances of that field, so essentially it will be indexed like that. I'm losing here the ability to connect between the names and their prices. I cannot now ask or get a correct answer for the question, a USB camera that costs $35 uh, or a USB camera that costs $100. Both will return this document, which is actually the, um, the, pro the category document and not the product document. So things get, start to get really messy here. Elasticsearch has a solution for that, for, uh, for, um, to be more exact, to be specific. It's called nested documents. I can essentially tell Elasticsearch those are sub-documents and Elasticsearch will take care of indexing them um, on their own and then allow me to do that cross type of, of query. But things are still a bit nasty, right? I still need to update the category document when I update a product or I get back the category document whenever I query for a product. Not, not that nice. Another option is to use the parent-child uh, approach. Parent-child allows me to have two different types two different sets of documents. So a set of documents, which is the categories, and then a set of documents, which, which is the products. And I, can, and I can tell Elasticsearch on insertion that this product uh, document is actually a child of a, pro, of a category document. And now I can search on products, I can search on categories, I get the two completely separate, uh, complete, completely different sets of documents, but I now in, one, in a single query, I can correlate the two. I can ask for products that has a parent and then specify a query on the parent, which is the category, or do it the other way. Ask for categories and, and, and integrate a query on has child that also queries on products, on the child documents. So it's very nice and it actually uh, works quite nicely. The issue with this is that I'm delegating the work to the query time. In search engines in general, we prefer to do as much work as possible during indexing time and then optimize for read time. I want to get to a point where my queries are 50 to 100 milliseconds at most on the 99th percentile. That's what I, where I want to be. This, this thing here is essentially a, some sort of a join that happens on read time. And that's not something I want to have if I can avoid it. In some scenarios, you can avoid it. We can do something that's called denormalization, which is kind of, if in that SQL databases we would do normalization, here we can just do denormalization and duplicate data. And in this case, I'm embedding the category data into the, my product data. Now, I have 
in one document all the, all the product docu uh, data, and I can search for it, I can aggregate on that, I can do whatever I want, and I also have the additional metadata on the category that I can filter on and do more interesting stuff on, on all, both on search and on aggregations. And that's very handy. Again, I'm still assuming I have one category for each product. And if I'll go deeper and I rec or more sophisticated system and start to requiring to have more than one category for a product, that could get interesting. I, maybe I'll be thrown back to the discussion on nested documents, for example. So things are starting to maybe become a bit more interesting, but just again, to give you the tip of the iceberg of, of a design discussion that you should be having um, when talking on, about a monolith index that is um, a replication of your data store. So just to give a few bullet points, um, always prefer flat documents with Elasticsearch. Try aiming to a design that only involves flat documents. Um, try as hard as you can not to have hard relationships. No joins, no um, nested documents. With this, it's pretty much a wedding between two different types of data. Um, you can get to a point where you have um, uh, relationships, but are, uh, they're a bit more loosely types. So maybe they're, they're done on the application layer. Maybe it's parent-child, which is, it's still some sort of a relationship, but it's more loose and, uh, and, and more things like that. Um, you shouldn't be afraid of denormalization. Denormalization is maybe some overduplication of data, and maybe it's, some, it's tying data together, but if done correctly, it can save you a lot of pain. And actually, with Elasticsearch, updating data on the go is not that hard to do. You can always write a small Python script or whatever to do some updates for you. There is an update by query API in Elasticsearch. And there is many ways to, to actually uh, fix uh, mistakes or you know, update data as you need to. As long as it doesn't happen too frequently, even if it's once a day or something that, like that, don't be afraid of that. Um, the main point with, when, when having a design discussion is try to aim for the query part. So try to optimize for reads, try to optimize for fast uh, queries, and that is the best advice I can give you. Don't, don't think about how the data looks like, think about how you want the data to look like on, query, on the query side, or when you display it for the user, or how are you, going to, are you planning to query that data. Um, and here again, the point about Elasticsearch index has been volatile, right? So over time, your questions might change or the way you want to represent the data might change. And that's actually going to work to your benefit because now you can just scrap the data and move to using a new index. And you can do that in zero downtime using index aliases. So moving on um, to the query side. Uh, first, if you had never heard of the Kibana console or previously called Sense, go now and check it out. Um, it basically allows you to quickly iterate on Elasticsearch and investigate your indexes, including autocomplete and, and all, that base, all, all that you need in order to work flawlessly with Elasticsearch. Um, starting uh, with uh, Elasticsearch uh, Kibana 4, 4, I think, it was embedded in Kibana already. Now they just changed its name and it's called Console. Um, very easy to do. Uh, there's also a Chrome plugin, uh, which I, I use. I find it very useful. Um, in, in Chrome, it, it, it's, it's called Sense, and it's very, uh, very handy. And when you do queries, um, and as I said, you want to um, optimize for query latency. You want to optimize your document designs for queries. Um, so, um, in order to do that, you need to understand what makes a query run faster or run slower. So, when in Elasticsearch, when you query, uh, there's going to be two uh, elements that are going to influence your query latency. So, uh, the way Elasticsearch works, it, when it queries, it applies two models. One is the Boolean model, whether a document answers the query or not satisfies the query or not. So that's the Boolean model. That's just basically go to the index, find the documents that match the query, and then get them back. After, after Elasticsearch does that, it, it tries to evaluate the score or the relevance of the document. And in most queries, it will do quite a lot of work to get that done with using some mathematical models. 
Um, and that's, you, we, that we can put under the title of the vector space model. Now, depending on what you're trying to do, that can be quite expensive to do. So think, ask yourself very, very uh, strongly, what, where do you really need scoring to be applied? And Elasticsearch gives you some ways to actually bypass that, uh, that scoring part if, if need be. Um, about that Boolean part, it is important to understand that all queries in Elasticsearch and basically in Lucene, which is what's powering it under the hood, are essentially two types of queries. One is the term query. Term query is just, uh, this is the term, this is the field, I want to go to that field in the index, see if there is this term in that index under that field, and give, give me back all those documents. Because um, a lot, most of the time I'll be asking about more than one field or more than one term in one field, um, there is a way to combine term queries using the Boolean query, which I'm sure all of you have seen before. But my point is that all queries in Elasticsearch, whatever query you're running, are essentially going to be boiled down into those two queries. So whenever you are running a query, ask yourself, what is this going to look like after a rewrite done by Elasticsearch behind the scene? So for example, a wildcard query, F star bar will be rewritten to whatever I have in the index that satisfy this pattern and then I'll have a big Boolean query with multiple term queries, and that would be the query that's going to be executed. So that query here that you see here is a very high level uh, query that is not essentially going to, nobody says it's going to be fast or slow, it will really depend on how many terms you have matching in your index. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, before Elasticsearch 5, that was the case also for numeric queries. How many of you have moved to Elasticsearch 5? All right, how many of you are Elasticsearch 2? How many of you are Elasticsearch 1? How many are not using Elasticsearch? Okay, so um, Elasticsearch, before Elasticsearch 5, um, numeric queries and geospatial queries, all, all of those queries that are not operating on strings were in fact operating on strings, all right? So those numerics would have been translated into some form of a string that let, let it, uh, makes it searchable. And those uh, range queries on numerics would have been translated to like Uber queries with tons, sometimes even millions of, of term queries. And that would result in very slow queries. Okay, so that's very important to know. It, it, it has been changed on, on Elasticsearch 5. But before Elasticsearch 5, that's a pitfall that you can definitely miss. And this is where you pretty much want to have those queries, A, cached, and B, um, optimize as much as possible. For example, not, not participate in any scoring. In order to do that, you just want to take that query and put it in a filter context. That will tell Elasticsearch you're not interested in scoring and that you, have, you give Elasticsearch a chance of actually caching it. So try to find queries that are quite intensive and put them in, uh, in the filter, in filter context, which is part of the uh, Boolean query. Before Elasticsearch 2, that would have been called a filter. We don't have that since, since Elasticsearch 2, but uh, it's a filter context ever since. If you're using scripts, take into account that it will slow down things a bit more, not only because of the language being used, because you, you can do that correctly using the expression language or painless language, which are basically compiled to bytecode, so the execution time doesn't matter, but there is an evaluation that happens on every result, and that's a bit slower, or slower than you would expect um, in, uh, without scripts. So scripts will also slow you down a bit. Um, another thing to note is about paging. Elasticsearch, Lucene are not meant to be used for deep paging. Um, if you are querying Elasticsearch and you're telling Elasticsearch, give me the first page, which is 10 results by default, and then you go to the next page, you're essentially making double the search. So the next search on this, for the second page is basically telling Elasticsearch, do the first search, do the second search as well, and then only give me back the last 10 results. 
This is how Elasticsearch and Lucene work behind the scenes. Um, so doing standard paging uh, from and size is not recommended um, for normal operation if you go deep. So two, three, four pages, it's, it's a no-brainer. It doesn't really matter. But if you go deeper and deeper, that's going to be slower, get slower and slower as you go deeper. So this is why. Another reason is that this paging is not stable. Because every time I go to the next page, I'm essentially running a new query. So that nobody guarantees that in page five, I will not see a result that I already saw in page four. That's because things can, the, my index changes, obviously. So some results can jump between pages between my paging operations. There is two ways to, um, to avoid that or to make that work uh, better. So Elasticsearch 5 introduced something that's called search after. And search after lets you basically quickly scroll to the last known position in using some low level mechanisms and then start from there. Okay, that would basically um, allow you to do deep paging and perform them much faster. There is another way that's called scroll and that's meant usually for when you really have to have um, stable paging, meaning every page has its own, uh, uh, you know that that page is definitely the right page. And also for highly performing queries, when you need to read lots and lots and lots of results back. So think 100, hundreds of thousands and millions of results back, and then you can do scroll. Starting in Elasticsearch 5, you also have slice scroll. You can also do this in parallel from multiple readers. So it's, it's really nice. My point is, just try to avoid deep paging as much as possible. And if, if what you do is just showing search results, your users don't, doesn't really need more than three, four pages max. Um, another question, you're doing search. Um, I guess you're also doing some full text search. You're doing some analysis. You're using some analyzers that take your text, break it down to tokens, and then um, normalize those tokens a bit. So do you know what your analyzers do? I'm asking because there is an interesting case of the Swedish Connect. Are there any Swedish people in the room? Awesome, so you'll know what I'm talking about. There is a Swedish Connect thing that's called, that's basically a way to connect um, or to, do, to shorten words, right? Please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not, I'm not Swedish speaking. So what happened is I was at the client's, and you know what, let me start from the beginning. Um, there is this Unicode organization. The Unicode organization is based, is their job is to make sure that we have standards for things that uh, relate to text. They came up with a Unicode standard that's called UAX29. That's a standard that basically uh, defines what text segmentation is, meaning um, I have a text and now I want to know what are the tokens in the text. In order to know that, I need to know what to tokenize on. Is white space something I need to tokenize on as punctuation marks? Is dot within a, a, a word something I need to tokenize? The question is depends, right? Because in English, a dot within a word can mean an acronym. In other languages, it does not. In Hebrew, for example, you have quote marks within a word, and that's actually legal. In other languages, you don't. Um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, what is a word boundary and what is not? So they sat down and wrote this uh, comprehensive guide or uh, standard. You can read it in the internet. It's quite comprehensive with lots of examples. And I went and sat at some client site and we had some issues with, with the search. Um, to demonstrate what we saw is something like that. We had two words and the editor of the content forgot to put a space between the column and the next word. So what happened is using the Elasticsearch default analyzer, which implements that Unicode standard, it basically produced this one token for those two words. After some investigation, it turned out to be just a private case of the Swedish Connect. Because the U Unicode standard um, defines, uh, again, it, pe smart people sit down and thought about what would be a comprehensive and the most correct way possible to tokenize and segment words and tokens. They also considered the Swedish Connect, which as far as I understand is an arcane case, 
um, to be something that you, they need to take care of. So they defined this, this segmentation case, which is a letter, a column, another letter from the uh, English alphabet to be an, a, a whole token and not tokenized on that column in the middle. So there are some more examples of that, of that Swedish connect, but what, what this causes is places where your editor, your text editor, forgets to put a space between two words and you had a column between those words, it will just render as one single token. Okay, that you, you would never guess that that's what happens, and that's actually uh, what happens based on the Unicode standard in pretty much every uh, Lucene and Elasticsearch implementation nowadays. So ask yourself really well, do you know what your analyzer is doing? And that's just uh, one interesting example. Obviously, I sent, I sent them an email asking them uh, to review that. Um, I never got a response back. I think it was like two years ago or something. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, if you want to know what your analyzer is doing, you actually have an endpoint to let you do that. You can just pass a text and specify an analyzer name um, to, uh, to use for, to analyze the text, and you'll get back a list of tokens that will get uh, into the index. Another recommendation I have for you that's not the default yet. I'm pretty sure it, it is going to get... Uh, to the default. So default analyzers will do um, lower casing for you, which is quite obvious. Um, because we are, you know, m usually most of the systems are pretty much multilingual today, and we uh, European languages have accented characters, and not every keyboard or not every keyboard user know how to use them. So um, I'm recommending to use the ASCII folding filter as well. ASCII folding will take letters that have accented letter, basically, and translate them or reduce them into their ASCII equivalent based, again, on some, on some standard mapping. And I'm recommending the use of the ASCII folding for filter on every analyzer. And that's an example of how to define an analyzer using the ASCII folding filter. How many of you are know and use engrams? OK. OK. So. Um, Basically, I've, I've seen way too many clients lately using engrams, and I started to realize that people see somewhere in some documentation, apparently an official recommendation of Elasticsearch, to use engrams for some scenarios. And 99% of the cases where you see engrams are being used, that's incorrect, and there's better solutions for that. So whenever you hear people tell you to use engrams, stop, don't do that and try to reconsider. So two reasons. Uh, people are usually using engrams to try and come up with a suggestion algorithm or a suggestion feature to their, uh, to their search. So engrams, because of the way they, you, they work, they let you tolerate spelling errors. Okay, so people do two things. One, they start using engrams. And second, they, do, they use, uh, instead of just using four or five grams, which will bloat the index but not do too much damage, they will use two to 10 and, uh, grams, which means they're going to bloat their index. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm um, speaking too fast and uh, not explaining what engrams is. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's better. Um, I'm serious. So instead of using engrams, go and use um, suggestors, which is just a way to do that correctly using Elasticsearch APIs. You can also do fuzzy search, which will pretty much do that for you in a much smarter way, all right? So that if you need suggest suggestions or suggestors, just go use suggestors. If that doesn't help, then maybe try to look at engrams. The second reason people are using engrams is because they have like model names and stuff like that. So they want something that mimics the contains search in SQL or whatever they came from. Um, and instead of doing that the right way, they're using engrams to support searches like that. So I want to find the, the, the WS500 is like, I don't know, a camera model. So I, if I want my user that if he types 500, I'll be able to find WS500. So they're using engrams for that, and that, that's usually when I see uh, people using 2 to 10 grams. Um, instead of doing that, check out the uh, word delimiter token filter which will do this in a much smarter way. It will just tokenize on those changes. So WS would be a token, 500 would be a token, 
Wi-Fi, so Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi. So that's just done correctly. Just a hat tip. Um, when you debug some some debugging tools for you, so if when you debug Elasticsearch or in queries and you want to understand what's going on behind the scenes, you have two things that are available to you. So query explanation can explain why a result came back and why it got the score that it got. It's not very readable, I agree, but it does let you, gives you enough information, mainly this part here, text uh, column fox, which gives you the field name and the actual token that got matched. That's very useful when you want to, re to understand why a result came up, and even better, why a result didn't come up. So you have two ways to approach that. In every search request, you can add a explain true, and that would add include the explanation. Don't do that in production because it's very slowing down the queries very much. Um, and if you have a specific document that you want to understand why it didn't come out, come back in a search in a search request, you have the underscore explain API that lets you send the query and the document ID and get back the explanation. And that is very useful to understand why that document didn't come back. So mostly useful for text searches and a very strong uh, debug tool. Another quite, quite new uh, debug tool in Elasticsearch is the Profile API. It's an API that lets you, um, again, ask Elasticsearch about a specific query, but this time not get why a result came back or not, but what are the performance metrics of that query within the Elasticsearch cluster. So pretty much every, uh, every component of the search is being analyzed and, and measured for, uh, for latencies. Another hat tip, um, there's this thing that's called named queries. Uh, in some cases, um, you want to be able to send multiple queries and get back results and then know which of the queries in the original query match the result. So if you have a Boolean query and you have multiple should clauses, in the results, you can using named queries, you can get back the names of the queries that matched each and every result. And that's very useful. It's, it can also sometimes replace use of aggregations, of term aggregations. And just, again, another hat tip. Um, try it out. I'm sorry I have to skim because I have some more content to cover. Um, so let's talk a bit about mappings. So how many of you have heard about in, of index templates? All right. Mappings, you know what I'm talking about? All right, so a mapping is the index schema. That, that is what's going to define how the data is being indexed, what analyzers are being used, and stuff like that. Um, what happens is, is that usually it's much easier um, to define the mapping that, over, that it doesn't change after a certain point in time. Just define, define it in Elasticsearch and let Elasticsearch do the heavy lifting of creating the index and applying that mapping. Um, that's being used uh, using the index template. So instead of creating the index explicitly and applying the mapping explicitly, you can use index templates, which are, you can ju just treat them as documents, and you just put them, uh, the mapping and tell Elasticsearch template column and some pattern, and then every time an index is being created using the, uh, that, and its name matches the pattern, the index template will be applied to it. You can have multiple index templates and they will be applied to it by some order that you can specify. So order zero, meaning this is going to be the first one that's going to be applied to the index that matches it. Um, another thing um, you may not be aware, but there is a field that you never define and maybe never use, and it's called an underscore all. Underscore all is being used usually by Kibana, so when you search on that bar, just write type words, uh, it will go to Elasticsearch and query the all field. If you don't use Kibana, you don't need it. If you use Kibana, um, what happens is that every piece of data that you put in Elasticsearch is being directed to the all field. And that's a blacklist approach, basically. So everything is going there unless you tell Elasticsearch not to, on a specific, a specific field, not to index it into the all field. Uh, in my opinion, that's a bad practice. And I think you should do the other way around. I think we should have some sort of a whitelist approach. So what I recommend usually is to disable the all field. You can do that in an in index configuration. 
and then use uh, Elasticsearch uh, mechanism that's called copy to. So you create the old field by yourself and use the cop copy to to do a whitelist approach on every field that you do want to copy from your documents to the old field for indexing. Um, and let's talk about types. So except from one use case, which I mentioned earlier, the parent-child use case, there is hardly any use case that I know of or that, that, that would justify using different types in one index. Let me explain. If you have many documents, and those documents are in a certain, have a certain schema, right? so if you put them in one index, you, uh, the, that index is going to be your manageable unit. That is how you, this is how you scale, right? Number of shards, number of replicas. This is your retention policy. So if you're using rolling indexes, so you can only work on a single index when you back up, when you delete, and, and do things like that. So it's, it's your SLAs in terms of uh, query latency. It's your retention policy. This is basically the manageable unit that you have. You cannot do anything with types. Types are just a logic unit that separates mappings in, of documents within a single index. So it doesn't give you anything. There is no reason for you not to just index it into another index and then basically um, benefit from another manageable unit. And worst case, you're just managing two different indexes. But best case scenario, which is usually what happens, you now you, are, you have better fine-grained control over your data. Right? So except from the parent-child scenario, which you have to have two different types in one single index, you, just, you should prefer using different indexes instead of uh, different types in one index. Let's talk a bit about cluster management. So you have, you have your data in, in somewhere in, on Elasticsearch, and that Elasticsearch cluster is hosted somewhere, whether it's on-premise, whether it's on cloud. Obviously, you protected it, and it's not exposed to the web. This is what we already covered. Um, and let's talk a bit about patterns and best practices to maintain it. So first of all, if you're using Elasticsearch as a key value store, or as some sort of a caching mechanism, just don't, all right? So just move to do this using a technology that's, that's meant, meant for that. Um, the reason for that is A, Elasticsearch doesn't have resharding capability. So once you need to shard your data further, you cannot do that with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch will just require you to do some sort of reindexing and stuff like that. It, it's not meant for that. Also, key value stores assume that data is sometimes updated. Elasticsearch is not, it's not good, it's not meant for updates, right? So when you update data in Elasticsearch, you basically do a delete and another write. The way Elasticsearch works under the hood, it works quite hard as, as soon as it has many deletes. And that, thus, it's not meant to be used as a key value store or to maintain something that's fre been frequently updated. If you're using Elasticsearch for searches and stuff like that, so, and you need to do deletes, that's perfectly fine. But if you're using Elasticsearch just as a key value store, just get by ID, you, you're better off doing it with uh, Redis, Cassandra, and other tools that are meant for that. Um, speaking about clusters, uh, there is this feature in Elasticsearch that whenever there is a change in the settings of your cluster, for example, a new node um, is being launched or one index started growing too large. So whenever the cluster is a bit unbalanced, using many, many um, metrics that Elasticsearch collects, Elasticsearch will opt to do some sort of rebalancing operation. That's quite costly. That means basically a lot of I.O. operations because now I'm going, I'm, Elasticsearch will read shards and then just try to move them to different nodes and swap shards between nodes because, because it, it, uh, it tries to get to a balanced state. It will not just move one node, it will always move one node and then another node, another, sorry, not node, shard, and then uh, move another shard to comp uh, compensate for that. So rebalancing will act, can cause um, latency issues with your queries. If you, if you have a requirement for low latency queries, 
um, you should definitely lock down rebalancing. And, and it's very, quite easy to do. There is an API for that. I'll show you in a second uh, in an even easier way to do that. Although it's been throttled automatically, we, I still see in lots of scenarios where rebalancing actually damages uh, performance quite, quite severely on many clusters. So just my, my advice, just disable it as much as possible. Um, speaking about shards, um, there's one frequently asked question is what is the optimal shard size? Uh, in my opinion, that's, a, in, uh, that's measured in two metrics. One is the number of documents per shard. And that, uh, as, far as, I, I can, as far as I can tell, based on many scenarios I've seen, there is a sweet spot of around 1 million documents. So once you have around 1 million documents per shard, not, not index, per shard, then searches will operate uh, very fast while still uh, taking uh, as much uh, optimization as possible from you know, the way the disk, uh, the, uh, it's stored on disk and stuff like that. And the second metric is the size on disk. So once you grow past five to 10 gig a shard, because shard is the unit that Elasticsearch manages in terms of, of scaling out, um, that would mean that scaling it out or like moving it between nodes or even initializing it into memory when a node comes up, uh, it takes quite a lot of time. And over five to, ten, to eight gigs, uh, that's taking too much time. So optimal size on disk is around five to 10 gigs and optimal size in terms of document count is around 10, uh, 1 million documents. Um, as far as debugging tools, I showed you some for, uh, for querying. They are more worth noting like a cluster allocation explanation. Why is this shard on this node, uh, et cetera? Some explain APIs, some profiling APIs. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, COPF is a very good tool for looking at your cluster and, sh and seeing what's going on. Um, it's not compatible with version five because version five deprecated sites plugin, which is what COPF was using. To, was using. Um, the guy who created COPF uh, created something that's called Cerebro. I don't recommend using that. Uh, I actually recommend using uh, COPF, but using that through Nginx or some uh, static HTML server and because just just static HTML it allows you to see a good picture of your cluster know what's going on and again don't forget to lock it down under some authentication mechanism as far as cluster topology goes um, make sure you don't mix and match hats or roles right so um, elastic search cluster should have uh, dedicated servers for each role so we have three roles, actually four, but let's ignore the fourth. Um, we have three roles. One is master or master eligible. You want to always have three of them, okay, exactly three. So that would allow you to, uh, to do, deal with network partitions. If you have one, you cannot deal with network partitions. If you have an even number, you could get to a split brain situation and everything above three is just a waste of money in most cases. So have three master nodes, master eligible nodes. One of them would be the master at every time. Elasticsearch will decide which one it is. Data nodes, just have as many as you want, depending, and sizing would depend on the actual uh, data that you're going to serve. And that is a bit hard to scale out. So master nodes can be quite lay machines. They don't have to be very beefy. Um, just have two cores, around four gigs uh, memory. That's enough. Uh, data nodes are going to be quite beefy. The sizing really depends on how your data looks like and what is the replication factor that you want. Um, amount of memory that you allocate to the J JVM really depends on your usage. You, nowadays, you don't have to, on version five, you don't really have to dedicate a lot of, lots of memory because you can take advantage of, of doc values for those of you who are familiar with it. So data nodes is going to be pretty much a constant number because it's hard to scale them out, mostly because of rebalancing. Then you have the client nodes, which you can scale up and down, uh, out and down, because it's very easy to do that. Um, there are just, st again, standard nodes, not anything too complicated, um, and they, ca they will be the ones to handle traffic and, and queries, this scatter and gather. Um, 
geographic distribution don't do that. Just stay in a single region, in a single data center. I've seen clients who actually go and create an Elasticsearch cluster on geographically distributed, not a good idea. Take a look at tribe nodes if you need to do that, or there's more ways to do that, and I'll be happy to, to have an offline discussion about that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time left, so I'll pretty much skim through this one. This is an original, uh, this, is, this image is from the Elasticsearch documentation, and it talks about the new way to ingest data. Elasticsearch introduced something that's called ingest nodes. Um, I don't really recommend using them because I prefer all the ingest work to be done on dedicated nodes, and this is what a Logstash uh, 5 does. Logstash in general does, and Logstash 5 does it in a much better way. It's way more optimized. They rewrote some stuff. Uh, my, my, um, my preference is usually to have ingestion, data ingestion and parsing, stuff like that, done externally to the clusters. So if you've heard about ingest nodes, that would be my recommendation. Some more recommendations here. Um, I'll post those slides there so, so you can see them. Um, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, thank you very much. And don't forget to protect your clusters. And again, if you need any help with that, feel free to reach out. Thank you.